the question at the end that you want to ask, or is it with all the preamble? Yeah, yeah. yeah. thank you. Okay. Right, okay. Um, thank you for allowing uh, me to address the committee today. My name is Julie Ryan, and I'm speaking on behalf of the Friends of Rybank Fields Community Group. Um, it's our position that council planning policy must be changed to ensure that the city's existing green infrastructure is first and foremost preserved by creating a mandatory brownfield-only development policy. According to Manchester City Council's five-year housing plan, which runs from 2018 to 2023, Manchester currently has over five years supply of deliverable housing sites, even if only sites that already have planning permission in place are considered. We're only part way through year two of the five-year plan, yet the figures clearly show that Manchester has in fact got seven years supply of housing sites with planning permission in place, and eight and a half years supply from all sites, including those currently without planning permission. These figures refer to housing deliverable from brownfield sites alone, yet this council, having declared a climate emergency, is currently sacrificing areas of this city's green infrastructure in addition to all those brownfield sites in order to subsidise other boroughs' housing deficits. We think this must be stopped. Moreover, rather than affording any real protection for our existing green spaces, the current Manchester Green and Blue infrastructure strategy reads like a manual on how to tick green boxes in order for a developer to get planning permission. This must be amended to include adequate protection for existing green and blue infrastructure. DEFRA have stated that proper stewardship of our natural world is at the heart of responsible government and that going forward it will be necessary to deliver a 10% net biodiversity gain on all new developments. On paper, this sounds like a positive move. However, again, it gives no real tangible protection to existing green space. It is, of course, necessary to ensure more sustainable and carbon-neutral development, but living walls and green roofs do not make up for the loss of destruction of natural habitat. <laughs> the planting of grass verges and a few lollipop trees to replace the woodland, grasses and shrubs that are systematically being destroyed by site clearances for development is mere tokenism. Many academics eschew the premise of net biodiversity gain altogether, maintaining that the losses, especially in terms of community and human impact, far outweigh the gain. A paper entitled What is Lost, Lo what is lost Through No Net Loss by Professor John O'Neill, Hullsworth Chair in Political Economy at the University of Manchester, <laughs> argues that the concepts of natural capital and ecosystem services that underpin the no net loss approach to environmental policy cannot capture important dimensions of value and that are central to human well-being. Furthermore, we need to ensure that a diversity of green space exists within our city to benefit not only us, but also the insects, plants and animals who all contribute in mitigating climate change. In April 2019, campaign group Rewilding Britain launched a petition calling on the government to restore nature on a massive scale to help stop climate breakdown by rewilding a quarter of the UK's land. Within two months, 100,000 people had signed to show their support and trigger a parliamentary debate, which took place in early November. The House responded unanimous, unanimously in favour of the petition, summing up that rewilding is essentially in integrating natural processes into land management and acknowledging that much of the government's spend to tackle climate change from 2021 to 2026 will focus on natural climate solutions. Our green spaces may not always look pretty and manicured, yet areas of scrub, overgrowth and weeds are arguably more important than city parks in sustaining important wildlife habitats and mini ecosystems. In conclusion, all existing green space within the Manchester Borough must be saved. Both the council and land landowners must be held accountable for this preservation by ensuring that these vital areas are afforded protected status, for example, as local nature reserves or managed in association with local community groups or partners such as Fields in Trust. 
For our planet's and children's future, we must protect our existing green infrastructure to ameliorate the negative effects of climate change. What steps will this committee and Manchester City Council as a whole take to ensure that this will happen? And can a local ward, ward plan help to achieve it? Thank you. Thanks very much. John, have you got a question relating 